Hello and welcome again to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and this program is a new idea that uh, we've had recently. I have with me David Lorimer. Hi David. Hi, nice to be here. And we're going to do a series of book reviews by David Lorimer. Now David is an extraordinary reader and I found out about him because my wife and I are members of the Scientific and Medical Network and they have this magazine every few months called Network Review and he reviews literally probably about a hundred books every edition so he's picked out four that he really likes about consciousness and culture for our first program in this series so David let's start with the first book that you've recommended which is by Ian McIlchrist the master and his emissionary the divided brain and the making of the Western world. And, yes. and the note, I haven't read. I haven't read these books. I yes. must uh, yes. make it clear. You give me some notes, though. Mm -hmm. And it took Ian apparently twenty years to write this book. That's right. Yes, it's the master and his emissary. Yes. Uh, and oddly enough, um, Ian was on um, Start the Week just this morning, um, right. talk, talking about it. Um, he has very unusual background. I've known him you know, for thirty years, and he was a fellow of All Souls in English. And he wrote his first book called Against Criticism, which came out in 1981. Then he retrained as a psychiatrist, and, and um, he's been a psychiatrist for the last 25 years. And so the book um, is the summation of everything he's learned about neuroscience in part one, and everything he knows about it, which is relevant to this theme, um, about culture and its development in part two. Um, and so in a way, it's two books, um, but uh, they, they, they were very keen to make them one book because otherwise you'd be dividing the, the culture in the way that you're dividing the brain um, right. in the book. So what is the essential, I wouldn't say message, but what is the basic information in the book? Well, the essential point is to do with the complementary functions of the right and left hemispheres of the brain or right and left, left hemisphere thinking. And, and the title reflects this in a slightly arresting way <clears throat> because the master is in fact the right hemisphere and the emissary is the, is the left hemisphere. But ordinary... course, in, in our culture, though, the left side is the more dominant, isn't it? Exactly, and the left side is being called the dominant hemisphere, which is why he's reversing this. Right. Um, so he's saying, not at all. The primary hemisphere and the most important hemisphere is the right hemisphere because it gives us access to the new... Uh, to the whole, um, to the context. The left hemisphere gives us a more analytical bit view. Um, and so the proper functioning between the hemispheres is that the right hemisphere starts the process off. Then, as it were, this is, these impressions are sent to the left hemisphere for sequential analytical processing. And then once that's happened, they are sent back to the right hemisphere for a further integration. Mm. And so what's happened in our culture um, is that the left hemisphere has taken over, which is what the emissary did. The emissary said, not paying any attention to the master anymore, we don't need him, right. uh, we're, we're self-sufficient. And so it's, it's the illusion, if you like, of the left hemisphere to think that its way of thinking and looking at things is self-sufficient and correct and doesn't need revising. Right, now how has that affected us as a culture? Well, very strongly. Um, Ian was talking this morning about the metaphor of the hall of mirrors. Um, so the left hemisphere is like a hall of mirrors. Everywhere you look, you can't get out of it. Hmm. Um, but what it's, what it's done is that the, the left hemisphere thinking is um, about this sort of abstraction. So the detached observer um, of modern science is very much a left hemisphere. He says... Ian says, the left hemisphere doesn't do empathy. The right hemisphere does empathy. Mm. So there's no empathy. It's impersonal. It's bureaucratic. It tries to control things. Hang on. Impersonal, bureaucratic, tries to control things. It's very much how governments work, big companies work. Exactly. And we could say religions work to some extent too. Yes, and even that communism tried to work like yes, that too. Yes. Um, but not, none of these things really work properly mm. because... Um, they, they, all, they all try and do too much with this you know, left hemisphere equipment, um, if you like. So I think the importance of the book um, is, that, um, is in bringing these things together and analysing the, the fact that our culture is out of balance, um, that we've veered far too strongly over to 
left hemisphere hemisphere way of looking at things, and we need to rebalance this um, with the intuitive, with the spiritual, with the holistic. On the other hand, mm. so this is a sort of light motif really within the scientific and medical network. The need for balance. And I gather he also talks about how the brain chemicals work too. Yes, he talk, he, he, the first part of the book gives, gives really a state-of-the-art report on the research um, agenda over the last 20 years. Um, but he also talks about music, origins of music, origins of language. It's absolutely fascinating and it's brilliantly written as mm. well. Um, so it's not for nothing that he was an English don before. His prose style is scintillating. And it's 600 pages, so it's, it's, it's 600 more pages. than a weekend read, isn't it? That's right. No, I think it's a holiday read. Mm. Um, because you, you don't want to rush it. Uh, you want to have the time to, to absorb it. Um, and you want also to have the time to think about it and think about the mm. implications. Because, as I think I said in my review, no one who reads it will think about themselves and our culture in the same way again. It's that important as a mm. book. It's just reminding me, we, we interviewed someone on Conscious TV a few months ago, Tony Wright, who wrote a book called Left in the Dark, very mm. much again about the left and right-hand side of the brain, and how he felt that the fact that we were so left-brain dominated as a culture was down to diet, and uh, how it was when mankind left the forests and started to cultivate, we changed our diet, and that affected the brain, but... Anyway, that's another... Yeah, I think that's another story. Yes. Really. I, I, th I think the, in what we can look back on, where, where there was a much better balance within the culture, is the Renaissance period. As it, mm. and Ian explains this, also some parts of Greek. So there you had a vision of the world, um, which was, which was uh, animated by the world soul, where there was a connectedness with nature. Um, so, so humanity was embedded in nature, and, and also there was a recognition of the importance of the esoteric philosophy and esoteric sources of wisdom which are being rediscovered at that time by the Florentine Renaissance right. thinkers. Okay, good. We're going to move on to... Okay. Uh, we need to whiz through them. Yeah. Uh, book two is A New Science of the Paranormal by Lawrence Lachan. Is that Lachan, that's right. Right, yes. yes. Well, Larry Lachan um, is um, still going strong age of 90. He was 90 this year. Um, and this is his, his most recent book, and a, a series of books that he's published over the last 30 or 40 years, um, particularly to do with consciousness. He's also written on cancer, but it's a different theme. Um, and the, the, import, the reason this book's important is because of the, as it were, the sociology of knowledge of how science looks at the paranormal. Um, because we've actually got 100 years of evidence um, you know, which, which people can look at, both scientific laboratory evidence and, more importantly, in my view, uh, evidence of people's experiences. Um, and so right at the beginning of the book, uh, there's a fascinating story about um, uh, Eileen Garrett, who was a very um, prominent medium and who worked in the American Society of Psychical Research, where Larry himself was, and she suddenly got a message from Hereward Carrington, uh, who died some years before, saying his wife was in real trouble and could they do something about it? Um, and she said, well, I don't know, I can't, can't do anything about this. And the next day she came in and said, I, I, had a, I, was, I fell out of bed last night because, you know, Herbert Carrington was trying to impress on me, this is really urgent, we've got to do something so, about it. Hang on, this is, this is a spirit who's getting in contact exactly. with a living person and, and saying the spirit his, is, is throwing the person out And of saying bed. his wife, well, I don't know what exactly happened, but, yeah. you know, his wife was in trouble. So they huge process getting in touch with the British authorities. Where was this woman living? And so, so they found out eventually that she was in a remote cottage in, in, on Dartmoor. Uh, and they, they sent the police um, to uh, find, see whether she was all right. In fact, she, she had injured herself and was lying on the floor, unable to move. And she'd been like that for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. uh, and so had um, this message not come through and had Larry Lachan not done anything about it, that woman would have died. And so this is an example of a, a very evidential piece of uh, a story, case history, if you like. So what Larry is saying in this book, he is saying that if scientific materialism cannot explain parapsychology, it's the wrong philosophy. It's the wrong way of looking at things. Because, and this is the most important point he makes, he says, impossible events do not happen. 
So if an event has happened, it means it's happened, and therefore it needs to be explained. Hang on. So impossible events do, do not, not happen. happen. Because the, what, what, uh, what a, a, a hard-nosed scientist might say is, I don't believe these things happen. I don't believe okay. this. I don't believe okay. this. I, I don't think it's possible. It's not possible these things happen. Hmm. But what Larry is saying was, I'm very sorry. These things do, do happen. happen. And Impo uh, impossible events do not happen because the, an event, event has already happened. It's not impossible. Yeah. So if it's not impossible it's, it's, and it's happened, then we need to find a way of explaining it um, which can make sense of the experience. Yeah. Well, you see, there's so much evidence, and like even even the U.S. military uses remote viewing, which I suppose is in in the I don't know if it's mentioned in this book, but it's the category of uh, the paranormal. Um, and I know that that there's there's certain psychics that work with the police force in in uh, in Great Britain. So yes, there is an openness there, isn't there, in terms of the military and and the police authorities. Yes, and indeed the intelligence services. Yes. Um, but I, I think there's a sort of mixed message coming out here because it seems a nonsense on the one hand for governments to say, well, obviously it works, that's why we're researching it, but then for the scientific establishment to say it's all, all nonsense. Yes. So I think Larry's point, and, and he... He elaborates how, he, how, how this whole field can be made, put into a scientific, onto some more scientific footing. I mean, it already is in, in, in some ways. But he's, he's one of the sort of grand old man of parapsychology. Um, and so, you know, what he has to say, I think, is extremely important, which is mm. why I think this book is an important one. It's not too long. It's... Uh, this one is 133 pages. 133 pages, not yeah. as long as the end so of the old Chris. This could be a weekend read, this uh, one. Absolutely. Yeah, but if absolutely. it's not something you know much about, it's a very mind-blowing, mind-expanding read, isn't it? Yes, it's very, it's very clearly written, and so I don't think yeah. that, that if you don't know anything about the field, I don't think you'd find it off-putting mm. uh, in that sense. And it has this very important case history in it, um, which gives you an example of the kind of evidence that is undeniable and, and requires explanation. Yeah, to just I'm just very you know on a personal level, my my wife Renata, who you you've met, she can actually leave her body. You know, she can physically go outside and she can go in the next room and tell you what's in the next room. She can go out of the planet and tell you what's happening there. So that's something for me that I've seen the proof of, and I yes. think a lot yeah. of us have may not have these abilities or seem to have the abilities ourselves but we see other people use these abilities and it's very hard to really keep on denying it i i i think so i mean I, I, maybe some people deny it in the laboratory and then they yeah. find it acceptable at home yeah i don't know okay we're going to move on to your third choice for mm -hmm. today which is the compassionate mind by paul gilbert hmm. um well this i think is another important book we had a um, a meeting in the Scientific and Medical Network recently called uh, Mind as Healer, Mind as Destroyer. And so we had Paul Gilbert speaking um, at the meeting. Um, a very, very interesting presentation. All this is available for download for, for members of the, of the network. Uh, and this book, um, The Compassionate Mind, um, is one that gives an overview of the various systems in the brain, um, including our are, as, well, as it were, the compassion system. It doesn't call it that, but that's what it amounts to. Uh, and uh, the hugely important um, fact that these pathways um, of compassion are wired up, as it were, quite early in life. And, and so it's very important um, for children being brought up, you know, to, to be brought up in an environment um, where they can feel compassion and learn compassion and see compassion. Uh, and this is obviously is, is, is a problem uh, in some parts of our society because where you have abuse in childhood, um, it tends to cascade down the generations. Mm. Um, so that uh, person who's abused then becomes an abuser. Mm. Uh, and so it's a, socially it's a very uh, serious problem. Um, however, what Paul says um, is that we can actually rewire ourselves um, for compassion and indeed it's the basis of Tibetan Buddhism many practices in Tibetan Buddhism um, and Buddhism generally uh, are about the development of compassion so what you're saying is what we are taught isn't necessarily what we become 
it is what we become, but that can yes, be changed. Yes, it can be changed. It's not always easy, and we all know how mm. difficult it is to change. Um, but uh, it can be done, and has been done. Uh, and so I think the, the, the larger question here is, uh, do we want a more compassionate society? And most people would say, well, of course we do. Well, in, this, in which case, um, how are we going to move towards a more compassionate society? How are we going to give people the opportunity to develop compassion? And not, com not just compassion for others, but also compassion for themselves. But briefly, how does Paul Gilbert explain how we can do this? Well, he gives a lot of practices in the book. So okay. he gives exercises in the book. Um, so you, as the reader of the book, um, can go away and, and, and do these exercises. Um, and I think, I mean, some of them are to do with uh, going, and I think this is an important part, being compassionate to oneself. Because a lot of us are very critical of ourselves. It's the starting point. I think we're, exactly. that, we're all going nowhere. Yes. Yeah. And so, so what he, he provides exercises to help people uh, move from self-criticism to self-compassion. Mm. And I think if you don't, as you say, if you don't start there, uh, you're not going to get very far with other yeah. people. And because yeah. what, how you relate to yourself and what you tell yourself um, influences the way you interact with other people and what you tell other people. So this is, um, from my experience, this is what's called the super ego in some some teachings. How you criticise yourself, and then yes. that of course yes. has repercussions in how you criticise the other. It does because you, we we treat others in roughly the same way as we treat yes. ourselves, or, or yeah. you know, vice versa. So I think you know when one is is looking at. Um, the future direction of society. This is an important um, thing to bear in mind, or possibility to bear in mind, because you know we set the compass towards the future, and so if we be explicit about this in the same way as Peter Dulov talks about a culture of love or a culture of wisdom, if we say that's what we'd like, we'd like a compassionate society, a, wi a wise society, society based on 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 reciprocity and love, um, then we can use that as a uh, acid test, as it were, uh, of the various policies and attitudes that we have. Mm. And this book is, uh, it's another big one, isn't it? Over 500 pages. So. Uh, it's a big one. Yes, so again, exactly. it's, uh, it's a holiday read. Yeah, and, it's a holiday read. And it's some practicing yes. to do with your holiday partner there, maybe with the exercises. Definitely. And, yeah. Yes. No, I think it's a very practical book, it's both theoretical yeah. and, and yeah. practical. Okay. The fourth book for today. Um, which has a fascinating title. It's uh, by Bruce Alexander, The Globalisation of Addiction. Yes. Um, I think uh, what's really interesting about this book um, is that it expands your idea about um, what uh, addiction means and the implications of addiction. Because if you were... Uh, ordinarily, um, you think of addiction, you think, well, uh, people are addicted to alcohol or addicted to drugs or whatever. But he not only says, well, all sorts of other things you can be addicted to, TV, video games, and, and so on. Uh, you can either, you can be negatively um, addicted to, to that, or you can be, as it were, mildly addicted, which doesn't actually ruin the rest of your life. And we all know about the obsessions and addictions. But his, his underlying thesis, which is um, what makes the book so interesting, um, is that the, root, the roots of addiction... Um, go much wider, uh, and they 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 involve the dis sense of dislocation and uprooting um, of the individual, which makes the individuals in that society susceptible um, to becoming addicted. So an example um, would be uh, American Indians uh, put into put into reservations, or Highland clearances. Um, people who then moved into to Glasgow, let's say, where, where they then form an enclave, um, an isolated enclave within um, another society. Uh, and, and historically, they then become very susceptible <coughs> to alcohol addiction and drug addiction um, in particular. So he's from Vancouver in the United States, and so he, mm. he looks at his own city of Vancouver as an example of um, his thesis. And so... What it, also, what it means is that globalisation involving um, competition, um, uprooting of people, standardisation, um, you cannot expect, uh, if this process continues in the way that it is doing at the moment, you cannot expect any lessening uh, 
of addictive patterns. Uh, and this is what's, I think, such an interesting thing to, d to discuss, because, yeah, because it because widens the, note, the lens. In the notes you've given mm. me, you know, and it's very true, it's not just, we, we normally think of uh, addiction as drugs and alcohol and sometimes sex, but here it's, it's, they're all obvious, gambling, shopping, romantic love, video games, religious solitary, television viewing, internet surfing, and even in... in emaciated body shape. Yes. It's a very nice yes, way of putting know. it. You know. Yes. But yes, these are all things that are addictions. And, uh, and, 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 and the, when I think about that myself, I think, well, actually, if you're not careful, the whole of your life can be an addiction unless there's an awareness. Yes. Without that awareness, yes. there has to be addiction. Well, I think it's because it's unthinking. Um, but, I mean, what's also interesting is he effectively says that um, religious fundamentalism is all, also an addiction. Mm. You, know, that you, you get addicted to, to your religion. And, and there, are, there are patterns. He, he looks at St. Augustine as somebody who was an addictive personality. He was addicted to sex at one point. Um, then, okay. he get, then he became <laughs> addicted to religion. Uh. And so what he, what he says is that there's a danger if you're addicted to one thing um, with an addictive personality. You then can change, get addicted to something else, and probably what you're addicted to next is better than what you were addicted to before. Um, but it still shows yeah. that same addictive pattern. Yeah. So does he talk about at all what it would be like as a human being not to have addiction? Well, what he what he says is that it's hugely important um, for human beings to have what he calls psychosocial integration. Um, so to feel part of a community and part of a, feel connected again. And so he says that if, if people can get a real sense of connection, um, then they don't need to be addicted, which is a kind of false sense of connection, um, if you like. So it's about what we talked about in the previous programme. It, it, it's about feeling the oneness, the interconnectedness of us, of us all, and human beings, plants, whatever. And it comes down to if we don't have that somewhere in our awareness then we lose ourselves and we look for this oneness and this satisfaction in terms of addiction to whether it be drinking too much, eating or shopping or whatever. Yes, it's a substitute. A substitute, say, but, yeah. But I think one doesn't need to have a cosmic feeling in order to, to escape this pattern. It's just a feeling of being connected to your immediate community and family mm. and environment. Okay. Um, so so it's, it's, the, it's the integration and feeling of connectedness on a, on a, on a small scale which is important in this yes. case. Yes. Okay, so thank you very much. There have been four, they're quite diverse books, but of course they do have that central theme as well. And let me just ask you personally, how long does it take you to read a book of five, six hundred pages? Um, well, I always, I always read it in chunks, obviously. I don't sit down and read the whole thing. So when yeah. I'm travelling, I do quite a lot of reading. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's, and I, I do most of my travelling by train. No, and so it's a very that's a very good place yes, to read, yes. I find. But I think it's also just worth remarking and concluding that each of these books has something to say about the relationship between consciousness and culture. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so that in in the face of the case of the first book, the Ian McGilchrist, um, you know, it's right and left hemisphere thinking and culture. In the case of um, the Lashan book, um, it's the scientific culture um, attitude to parapsychology um, and the cultural. People in general are much more accepting of this than, than the scientists. Uh, in the third book, um, we're talking about culture and compassion. How can we develop a culture um, more, with more compassion, but by means of a consciousness process? And then in the fourth book, um, we're, we're looking at um, the relationship between addiction and culture and how culture needs to change in order for these addictive patterns um, you know, to be less serious than they are. OK, thank you. Thank you very much for coming along, sharing your insights from the books. And, uh, Pleasure. Thank you very much for watching David Lorimer talk about books on Conscious TV. And this is the first in a series of programmes, so do look out for the uh, subsequent ones. Goodbye.